How's everybody doing tonight? Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Look oh. at all of these beautiful people, man. It's part reunion and part just joyful experience. Uh, my name is Josiah Luis Alderete. I'm a Pocho poet and proud Spanglish people speaker. And uh, I want to welcome you all, all you beautiful people, to City Lights Books' first ever live online event, y'all. This is City Lights Live. So you are all part of history. Give a little clap there. And uh, when I say all of you, uh, there are a lot of all of you. I mean, we, we got like a 500 seat uh, uh, event going on tonight. So it's going to be a beautiful thing. I expect some uh, um, some silly shenanigans from all of you because you got kind of like a Hollywood Squares Brady Bunch thing going on. Periodically look to the square next to you and wave at them if you'd like to do that, you know, to keep it interesting. So yes, yes, yes. And um, I'm not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating when I say this is a genuine monumental occasion, people. Because I mean, well, what other time in history uh, would I be able to host a show of this literary magnitude from the comfort of my own home? I'm not wearing shoes. I'm making vegetable stock in the next room. It's beautiful, man. And we got, and we got I'm gonna introduce some amazing poets tonight. So this is a, this is a truly monumental literary occasion, tu sabes? And uh, for those of you that don't know, and it's hard to not know, but we're here because City Lights is um, here to show our gratitude to our customers and our supporters, all of you, uh, helping us get through this. And uh, what we've done is we've asked a truly stellar cast of literary hoodlums, revolutionaries, fire and medicine women, poets to be here with us and to bless us with some of their work. Now, um, to start off this event though, uh, we gotta have the meta meta man, uh, the one and only, the jefa, the whole of, of City Lights, uh, uh, our, uh, the one and only Elaine Katzenberger, who's the publisher executive director at City Lights, and she's going to say a few words to start us all off. So, Elaine. My, both my art. Both my art. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're muted. Me. Ah, okay. I am unmuted by the host. Is this working? I cannot see anything. I cannot hear anything. You can hear me. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to talk. I can't see or hear a thing here. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are here to say thank you. Um, when we first uh, organized this event uh, or thought about it, it was in the heat of we need to have a fundraising campaign. What can we do to make sure it's a success? Oh, we should have a benefit because then we can draw attention to it. And then it turned out that um, the attention was immediate and so powerful and strong and uh, overwhelmingly supportive that um, by the time we were able to organize an event like this, it, it was going to be something quite different. And so I want to say thank you to everyone who has supported us, to anyone who thinks about supporting us, to anyone who will support us. We actually do need it. Um, we need it in so many ways, just like everybody needs it. And I think that what is beautiful about City Lights, what's always been beautiful about it to me, is um, that being part of it means you're part of something that is really uh, big and shared and communal. And that is just true. And so my years of being there in support of it means that I'm in support of all of you and all of the rest of these people who are manifesting around the world to say, we love this. We love the ideas that this represents and we want it to continue. And I believe the same thing. Um, and it's not just City Lights, but City Lights holds a certain 
place in everyone's mind and heart. And it has to do with the power of what is best about humans and humanity and harnessing that for the creative good of all. And uh, I truly believe that is our work when it comes right down to it. And I know that that's what is resonating among everyone when they want to support us and when they want to support each other in supporting us. And I feel uh, intensely grateful for the years that I've been able to spend doing this and for the uh, affirmation that we are receiving. And, um, and thank you, Josiah and Caitlin and Stacy and all the people at City Lights who are working on this event. And I hope that I can see the rest of it. And I, um, I'm so grateful to also to the, uh, the authors who are participating tonight. We have such an amazing group of people and some of you are my personal friends and some of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, but I know you because I know your work and um, this is so beautiful and I'm really, um, I'm kind of overwhelmed. So I'm gonna turn it over to the next person. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, uh, for those of you out there in Zoom land that don't know, it has become customary to do jazz hands when you really like what the person said. So give some jazz hands up to Elaine for that beautiful statement. Jazz hands all around, right? Jazz handy. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a, it's, it's a whole new world, people. No more clapping, we do the jazz hands. So um, gracias, Elaine, that was, that, was a, that was a beautiful way to open, open, the, open the reading. So um, yeah, like Elaine said, we have an amazing lineup of, of poets, writers, um, some City Lights Familia, some, some others, but um, we're just gonna kick it off and get it started. And uh, I'm so excited for this first performer, y'all. Um, Beth Lissick is a uh, writer and performer who just published her first novel, Edie on the Green Screen. Uh, Beth was the host of the Porchlight Reading Series. Woo! That's, a, that's some Bay Area love right there, man. And Beth lives near Woodstock, New York with her family now where she joins us tonight. So please, y'all, please give a big City Lights welcome to Beth Lissick. All right, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I was supposed to launch my book at City Lights on April Fool's Day, which I love that Peter put that, that uh, date aside for me. And sorry that I couldn't be there, so I'm uh, sitting here in my house at 10 o'clock at night and happy to see all my friends and all the people I haven't met and happy to be here for City Lights who has truly been there for me every time I've done anything and and as just always as a as a place to go and so City Lights really is there for all of us. Um, this is my book uh, Edie on the green screen. I'm just gonna read a short part from the beginning and the narrator is from the Bay Area. Um, this part that was before the Silicon Valley was called the Silicon Valley when it was called the Valley of Heart's Delight, representing San Jose here. At one time, home with hundreds of apricot trees. Oh no, wait, I, I oh, am I still in? Yes. What happened with my thing, okay. All right. At one time, home with hundreds of apricot trees. On summer mornings, me and my friend Josie would walk among them, the leaves forming canopies, branches hanging heavy with small golden bulbs. We worked in the orchard's old barn at long splintered tables, pulled out armloads of fruit from the bushels the pickers left, cutting out the pits and setting them on trays to dry in the sun. We made 10 cents a tray, same as the Mexicans and the Vietnamese, and if we worked steadily, we could make up to $50 a week. But we hardly ever worked steadily. We would talk next to nonstop about anything we'd just found out about. The Clash, Kalyani Scotsy, oral sex, Ella Fitzgerald, burning zits off your back, apartheid, <laughs> Keith Haring, where your meat comes from, AIDS. We would stretch out on grain sacks in the sun, tanning our bony bodies dark as the tree bark, or ride bikes to the frozen yogurt shop to watch the older kids kiss and fight. 
At the end of the day, we'd wind up back in the barn, fingers sticky with juice, apricots split and laid out in even rows, the late afternoon heat on our skin, listening to college radio. Where would we be without the radio station at the junior college to crack open our worlds like eggs, to show us what else was hidden inside the small, smooth universe we currently knew? All praise the patois of the college radio DJ. The sheer relaxation of delivery, the shuffling of papers on the mic, the stall for lost liner notes, the humble struggle to remember or pronounce a difficult band name. The laugh following the record skip, the dead air of an ill-timed bathroom break, the droll ramble of the public service announcement and the promise that the next song up was going to blow our minds. Discovering college radio meant that I said goodbye to my mom's AM radio of traffic and weather together on the eights or mellow gold songs about angels in the morning and pina coladas. The college DJ sounded like people I wanted to meet someday, laid back, in the know, hot with some fresh tip, ear to the ground, curious, nerdy, not ashamed. I carried my pitting knife like I was a Latin queen in Chicago instead of a suburban girl earning cash to buy jeans and records. It was a sharp switchblade with a handle carved from an olive tree that once belonged to my grandfather on my mom's side, the Polish one. I'd wear it on my belt, the weight of it informing my swagger as I walked back home on the pristine black asphalt of the streets in the new housing developments. Green lawns, ranch houses with three-car garages, shiny black mailboxes with little red flags, heavy Spanish-style doors with brass hardware, freshly planted agapanthus and lavender and white, and obedient juniper stretching across the curbsides. All of this where acres of apricot and prune trees used to be. I refused to take piano from the hollow-cheeked bun head at the end of the cul-de-sac or play soccer in those balloony white shorts with my ponytail bobbing behind me like a punchline. Instead, I practiced my scowl for the teenage boys who jumped fences between yards, sharpened my knife blade on the fine grit of a ceramic stone, and watched TV show after TV show while drinking generic orange soda and eating frozen French bread pizzas. I felt like I was an animal lying in wait. Something was out there, and if I paid attention, I would hear a signal calling for me. Josie and I had hatched a lot of plans in that barn. The best one that didn't come true was that we would move to the city, to San Francisco, start our own line of apricot-based beauty products. Think of the low overhead with all of those free apricots. We hoarded the pits and made our own makeshift lab, smashing the almond-shaped stones with hammers on the concrete pad back where Josie's parents parked their camping trailer. And then we mixed the coarse dust with coconut oil from the pantry and vanilla beans swiped from the grocery store. We put them in jelly jars and went door to door selling it to our neighbors. And the part that we kept secret was that we knew the pits were supposedly full of arsenic until roasted. We schemed about doing a tidy business as poisoners for hire on the side. Thank you. Yeah. Woo. Keep them keep them jazz hands going for, for, for her. I love Thank it. It's finally time for a jazz hands comeback. <laughs> 20 years in the making. That's We're all right. Ready. That's right. Hey, hey, hey Beth, and I also want to say Beth Lissick experience. Oh man. Ordeal. Ordeal. Oh no, man, that's the real that's the real <laughs> that's the real San Francisco right there. Y'all. That, was, that was beautiful. Gracias, Beth. Thank Gracias you so much. And uh Hey, audience, uh, James Tracy would like you all to know that in addition to jazz hands, it's okay to do power fists too. So we got the power fist. Hey, Avi, I see you there. Do a power fist. Yeah. Right on. All right, y'all. We're going to keep it going with our next amazing, amazing reader uh, coming right up is uh, Karen Finley, who is a performance artist, musician, and writer. And she's the author of the landmark City Lights publication, Shock Treatment. Her most recent book is Grabbing Pussy. She joins us from her home over in New York. Y'all give it up for Karen Finley. Um, hi, this is Karen Finley, and I'm so happy to be 
be here. And I just want to make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Just yes. Okay, great. Excellent. It's so moving for me to be here and to participate. And thank you, uh, everyone at City Lights in the audience. And as, as uh, it was just said that, yes, City Lights published my first book, A Shock Treatment, edited by Amy Shoulder in 1990. And it just has been a thrill and a great privilege to be part of this extraordinary publishing house, but also their part of their store too and everything that they have given the universe. And so it's so wonderful for me to be here. I'd like to read now The Black Sheep, which was published in that collection, Shock Treatment. And it is about the AIDS crisis, and I feel that it has a relevance today. The Black Sheep. After a funeral, someone said to me, you know, I only see you at funerals. It's been three since June. It's been five since June for me. And he said, I've made a vow. I only go to death parties if I know someone before they were sick. Why? Because cause I feel, I feel so sad because I never knew their lives. And now I only know their death. And because we are members of the black sheep family. We are sheep with no shepherd. We are sheep with no straight and narrow. We are sheep with no meadow. We are sheep who take the dangerous pathway to get to the other side of our soul. We are the black sheep of the family called black sheep folk. And we always speak our mind, appreciate differences in culture, believe in sexual preferences, believe in no racism, no sexism, no religionism, and we'll fight for what we believe. But usually we're pagans. There's always more. One in every family. And even when we're surrounded by bodies, we're always alone. You're born alone. You die alone, written by a black sheep. You can't take it with you, written by a former black sheep. Black sheep folk look different from their families. It's the way we look at the world. We're a quirk of nature. We're a quirk of fate. Usually our family, our city, our country never understands us. We knew this from when we were very, very young that we weren't meant to be understood. That's right, that's our job. Usually we're not appreciated until the next generation. That's our life, that's our story. Usually we're outcasts, outsiders in our own family, don't worry, just get used to it. My sister says to me, I don't understand you, but I've got many, many sisters here with me tonight. My brother says to me, I don't want you, but I've got many, many brothers here with me tonight. My mama says to me, I don't know how to love you. I don't know how to love someone like you. You're so different from the rest. But I've got many, I've got many. I've got many mamas with me here tonight. Oh, my daddy says to me, oh, my father says to me, I don't know how to hold you. I don't know how to be there for you. I don't know how to protect you. I don't know how to love you. I don't know how to support you, but I've got many. I've got many. I've got many, many daddies here with me tonight. We're related to people we love who just can't say, I love you, black sheep daughter. I love you, black sheep son. I love you, outcast. I love you, outsider. But tonight we love each other. That's why we're here, to be around others like ourselves so it doesn't hurt quite so much, so it doesn't hurt quite so much in our world, our temple of difference. I am at my loneliest when I have something to celebrate and try to share it with those I love but who don't love me back. There's always silence at the end of the phone. There's always silence at the end of the phone. Oh, sister, congratulate me. No, I can't. You're just too, too loud. Oh, grandmother, love me, love me, love me. No, I don't know how to love someone like you. Sometimes the black sheep is a soothsayer, a psychic, a magician of sorts. Black sheep see the invisible. We know each other's thoughts. We feel fear and hatred. And sometimes some sheep, 
Sometimes some sheep are chosen to be sick, to finally have average, flat, boring people say I love you. Sometimes some sheep are chosen to be sick, so families can finally come together and say I love you. Oh, sometimes some sheep are chosen to die, so loved ones and families and countries and people and neighbors can finally say your life was worth living. Your life meant something to me all along. Sheep's destinies are not necessarily having families, having prescribed existences like the American dream. Sheep's destinies are to give meaning in life, to be angels, to be conscience, to be nightmares, to be actors in dreams. And black sheep can be family to strangers. We love each other like mother, father, sister, brother, child. We understand universal love. We understand unconditional love. And we feel a unique responsibility, a human responsibility for feeling for all others. We can be all things to all people, yeah. We are there at 3.30 a.m. when you call, and we're here tonight. We're here tonight because I just can't go to sleep. I have nowhere else to go. I'm a creature of the night. I travel in your dreams. I feel your nightmares. Oh, we are your holding hand. We are your pillow, your receiver, your cuddly toy. Oh, I feel, I feel, I feel your pain. Oh, I feel. I feel, I feel your pain. Oh, I wish I could relieve you of your suffering. I wish I could relieve you of your pain. I wish I could relieve you of your destiny. Oh, I wish I could relieve you of your breath. I wish I could relieve you of your life. Oh, I wish I could relieve you of your fate. I wish I could relieve you of your illness. I wish I could relieve you of your body. I wish I could relieve you of this death. But it's always silence at the end of the phone. Silence at the end of the phone. Silence at the end of the phone. Silence. Yeah, y'all. Yeah. Oh. That was Karen. Karen Finley. Gracias, Karen. That was profundo. That was, that was, uh, that was, that was, as only you could read that. That was amazing. Man. A little bit more jazz hands for Karen Finley. Please, come on. Some fist bumps, man. That was, a. Uh, that was from the heart and the blood, man. Woo. All right. All right, y'all. We're going to keep going. Uh, just want to welcome some of the uh, late comers. I see some folks coming on late. This is City Lights Alive, L City Lights Live, rather. City Lights Live, the first live online broadcast by City Lights Books. So uh, this is a really special night and we're, we're surrounded by some really amazing artists and writers. And we have, we have you, we have, we have our, our, our City Lights family from all over, man. We got people from New Orleans, from Austin, Texas, Cleveland, Ohio, Mount Shasta. Woo! Atlanta, Georgia, Toronto. I see some aliens in the audience too, man. I know you all from some other planets, I could tell. So this is a, a beautiful thing. This guy's a little hot. Oh, yeah, oh man. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to keep it going. And um, the next poet to perform is uh, the current poet laureate of San Francisco. And it's always such a pleasure to have her in any event that we're a part of. Uh, truly, this is uh, Kim Shuck whose uh, recent book, Deer Trails, was uh, recently published by City Lights Books. And she joins us from her home in San Francisco, y'all. Give it up for Kim Shuck. Sheil, um, it's funny to hear that referred to as jazz hands because I always think of it as deaf applause. <laughs> My grandfather was deaf. Um, I'm gonna start with a piece from Deer Trails. Saved. Feast of all souls prepared with the bones of the dead. The packed memories of a family who presses flowers, saves recipes and skies and the tips off of shoelaces. This is a sky I might save. Fold into a fortune teller with its bands of hot pink, with its echo of a phone call from the disappeared mythical cousin, because anything at all is possible at any moment. 
I will carry dice from now on, develop a system of predictions based on soup, crackers, and replace the latches on the doors of a house in a storm that selectively pries at the deepest secrets to reveal that they are not where we left them. Um, I've been writing a poem every day since we've been sheltering in place. Quarantine poem 24. Write out your heart longhand as if you were tying your ship to the dock in your home port. Write out your concerns for those on the street, those they are gathering, for those targeted in this time of pandemic, as some group always is. Let the small joys expand. Let them heal you. Because we need both empathy and care, let us, in these hills, call one to another, one to another. Are you well? Stay well. You're loved. Quarantine poem 25. We wear the tree bark like a skin and let our sap drop. Harder now at this time of year when this particular full moon is calling us. Bloom, she sings. Wearing our indoors, our snugged down, saving our leaves in every drawer. Bloom, she coaxes, like a trickster for a change, while Rabbit and I deal another hand of cards. Um, and this one's Quarantine Poem 32. Earth's nictating membrane extends, retracts, like the April fog. A spell of gratitude starts here. Gadugi. Mutuality, the only solution. Each drummer, each dancer, each piece of ceremony aligns the circle, dances down the grass, brings healing, resists conformity, holds the spaces between. Balance, balance and stay well. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Keep it going for Kim Shuck. That was wonderful. Gracias, Kim. Yeah, gracias, Kim. Man, that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Kim. Hey, hey, Kim. We have a comment here. Uh, someone really likes your kitchen. So, in addition to having insane poetic powers, Kim also has an amazing kitchen. So. That's, that's, that's something to be said in this day and age. All right, y'all, you all ready for our next, our next uh, speaker, our next reader, our next uh, person up? Uh, I'm excited about this, y'all. Uh, next up is Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, who's a historian, activist, and writer, whose recent book is Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, which was published by City Lights. She joins us from her home in San Francisco, y'all. Give it up for Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Good evening, and thanks to all of the City Lights people who made this possible, uh, Elaine and Stacy, um, Caitlin, and of course, Jonah. Um, thanks to the other writers, and thanks to those from around the country and the world who have joined us. I've been reading the chat, and thank you so much for uh, supporting City Lights. We are told that the mood uh, of the evening is to be gratitude. And there is much to be grateful for in this strange time. Most of them healthy. And gratitude for the compassionate and courageous health workers, the farm workers invisible to many who provide our food, those who deliver food locally and those long haul truckers carrying goods, risking their lives, and for government officials and workers at every level, especially the postal workers, who are trying their best despite the criminal negligence of the current federal administration. And gratitude for the Ohlone people who survived colonial genocide, 
and whose unceded land we inhabit here in the Bay Area. But gratitude is inseparable from grief. And there is much and many to grieve. Above all, for the victims of the virus who are disproportionately poor and black and brown and native, as well as the incarcerated, those without shelter, those who lack documentation, the refugees at the border. I want to recall another catastrophe and the federal uh, failures, that of August 2005, Hurricane Katrina. I wrote and published an essay at that time that I called John Wayne and the New Orleans Indians. This is an excerpt. The cavalry is coming, announced a reporter on the Fox News Channel, when finally National Guardsmen trooped into downtown New Orleans on the fourth day of apocalypse in August 2005. I said to myself, there they go again, the racist lying Fox News. But no, they were reporting the actual news. I switched channels and found reporters and government officials repeating the same phrase. The cavalry has arrived. I should, have not, should not have been surprised during the preceding two days. They had been referring to the scene in the waterlogged New Orleans, not as genocide as I saw it, rather the Wild West. Racism on top of poverty, revealing the scaffolding of the United States history, its intact structure bared, all the glitter and trappings washed away. New Orleans became Indian country, that military term for enemy territory. This place is going to look like little Somalia, Brigadier General Gary Jones commander of the Louisiana National Guard's task force told the Army Times newspaper. We're going to go out and take the city back. This will be a combat operation to get the city under control. The Army Times report could have been about the ongoing U.S. wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and stating, while some fight the insurgency in the city, Others carry on with rescue and evacuation operations. For days, I have been thinking about FEMA's total lack of preparedness and lack of life-saving supplies, and Sitting Bull's observation that the United States knows how to make everything, but doesn't know how to distribute it. Sitting Bull was being generous in attributing the lack of equitable distribution of goods to benign ignorance rather than to design. But he knew better. While in federal custody, but under Buffalo Bill Cody's supervision, he was allowed to perform with Cody's Wild West. Setting Bull spoke through his translator to huge crowds of ragged white men, women, and barefoot children. I know why your government hates me. I am their enemy. But why do they hate you? In December 1890, the 7th U.S. Cavalry, Custer's old regiment, intent on revenge for their loss and Custer's death 14 years earlier at the Battle of the Bighorn, massacred City Bulls, unarmed, starving people, at Wounded Knee Creek, a few days after Setting Bull himself had been shot and killed by the federal Indian police. The cavalry set into the Wild West of New Orleans had orders to pin in the starving black population in order to protect property. It is not a, it, it, it is not a sad or shameful day for the United States. It is a typical day in the United States for the poor magnified. How ironic that the Superdome became a house of horrors for the dispossessed for five grueling days. Most of the African Americans who were herded into that Superdome came from the infamous New Orleans projects. 
and are the families who were evicted 35 years earlier from their neat little shotgun homes in the working class district that was seized and bulldozed to build the Super Bowl with public funds. Their cemetery was also destroyed. Despite fierce mass resistance by the community and their allies, construction began in August 1971 and was completed four years later. Thanks. Keep it going for Roxana Dunbar Ortiz. Yes. Gracias for those truths, Roxanne. We appreciate it very much. Man. Thank you. Yes, yes. All right, y'all. You are you are tuned into City Lights Live. I hope, I hope, I hope you're having as good a time as I am. Oh man. All right, people. Next up is the one, the only Jack Hirschman. As many of you know, Jack Hirschman is a poet and social activist who has authored over 50 volumes of poetry and essays. That's 50 volumes, y'all, and essays, including front lines in the City Lights Pocket Poet Series, as well as all that's left in the City Lights Poet Laureate Series. He joins us right here from San Francisco. Give it all up for Jack Hirschman. Looks like, looks like Jack's playing with our affections a little bit. He's, he's doing one of those fashionably poet late things. So <laughs> we're just going to keep it going. We always got a space for Jack. He can come by whenever he wants. Uh, we're waiting on you, Jack. But in the meantime, we're going to keep it going. And uh, I'm very, very excited to introduce our next performer. Um, God, it, this poet came in and, and performed uh, uh, last year at City Lights and just blew us all away downstairs with his performance and his visuals. So this is really exciting to have him here. Um, Janaka Stuckey is a poet, performer, and the publisher of Black Ocean Press. His most recent book is Ascend, Ascend from Third Man Books. And he joins us all the way from the East Coast, y'all. Give it up for Janaka Stuckey. Thank you. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, I am in Boston where it's now 1040 p.m. And normally I would have done my weekly unplugging for a, a few hours ago, probably, <laughs> to remain offline until tomorrow night. But I'm very happy to be with you all here celebrating City Lights, a uh, true cultural institution and one of the most iconic bookstores in the world. Um, in 2012, I wrote an essay for the Poetry Foundation outlining how independent bookstores could survive in the age of Amazon by ending uh, the sort of doomed competition for price or selection and focusing on being a third place in our social lives that fosters community and human interaction. Uh, in that way, these bookstores become, through the nuanced fact of their physical being, something that Amazon, by its very business model, is the antithesis of, a space where we experience history, and thus also time. The essay I wrote went somewhat viral and was picked up by the Huffington Post. A short while later, Amazon did make a foray into the brick and mortar world of books. And I like to tell myself it's because Bezos read my article and wanted to prove me wrong. Uh, those stores, by the way, still lack the spirit of the third place. So for those who may not be familiar with the term third place in community building, the third place is the social surroundings separate from the two usual social environments of home, which is the first place, and the workplace, which is the second place. Other examples of third places would be churches, cafes, clubs, public libraries, bookstores, or parks. But now we're here tonight to think about how bookstores can survive in the age of COVID-19, an age where we are largely physically confined to the first place of our houses and apartments. 
So I've been thinking a lot about what that means when second and third places exist somewhat abstractly, when the barriers between them all start to blend as they happen concurrently online and in our homes. What is the value of the third place now, if it can even exist at all, and even then only online? Well, this morning over my coffee, I was thinking about Shabbat and the value of observing it, not just in my own life, but for Jews all over the world. In the thousands of years following the destruction of the Second Temple, over the course of the Jewish diaspora and multiple programs throughout the world, Jews have learned to use the Sabbath as a way to construct a temple in time rather than one in space. Through ritual and language, we sacralize time. And in the duration of this sacred moment, we exist outside of mundane life, in complete rest, radically present within a world utterly perfected by our own making. So here we all are tonight, together in a kind of ritual making this time sacred through language. Each of us a scattered monad and also simultaneously a single monad. The whole of us no greater than the least among us. It doesn't matter where you are, only what you choose to do with the time you have here. The third place is now not somewhere we go, but a place we become simply by being together. But bookstores still exist and bodies still exist. And one day our bodies can be together in those bookstores. So we have to keep both our bookstores and our bodies going until then. So for now, I'll close with the first poem I ever read at City Lights, a moment that was for me the apex of my life's work to that date. The art of loss is a lost art. Because I love a burning thing, I made my heart a field of fire. In this way, I own nothing, can lose nothing. The moon cake you fed me remains a ghost upon my tongue. Immortal wasp, tiny white flame I have never touched. The truth is, we are perfect. Hours unspent like diamonds in the invisible now, without each other, still, we are perfect. I make with my mouth the hour of your arrival again and again in my indefinite sleep. Thank you. Give it up. Give it up, y'all, for Johnny K. Stuckey. That was gracias for that rumination, hermano. Thank you so much for that.
That was, that was, that was something. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, man, this is deep. How's, how's everybody feeling out there? Everyone still with us or what? Give me, give me some kind of a sign, people. Come on. That was after something like that, man. Woo. Man. All right, y'all. You are, you are tuned into a City Lights Live. City Lights Books is a first online live event, and we're celebrating with some amazing uh, writers and poets. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Jazz, jazz hands. That's what we see in the audience here. And uh, mysterious Chris in the audience there with a mask. He keeps holding up a sign that says we should uh, remember that on 324, it's Lawrence Ferlinghetti's 101 birthday. So we got to take a minute to acknowledge that. The grant, the papa, the founder, the blood of City Lights Books, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, will be 101 on 324. Thank you for bringing that up, mysterious Chris with the mask. I don't know what's under there, but you got a lot of heart. So uh, yeah, let's, let, let's take a moment and say good to Lawrence. Yeah, send him some love. So uh, next up, uh, uh, speaking of San Francisco icons, uh, Mr. Jack Hirschman, are you in the audience? Are you there, Mr. Jack? Jack's gonna make his work for it, I think. Y'all, anyone, anybody see Jack in the audience? <laughs> no? All right, all right. Jack's just, Jack's just playing with our affections. He'll show up, I know he will. Uh, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the next, uh, ne next, next, uh, next poet. Oh man, this poet right here. You wanna talk about barrier culture. Woo! Came up, came up, came up on that 16th Street Poets event going on, man, down there by the BART station back in the day. And this, this poet here has just exploded into an essential part of the Bay Area, Cultura. So uh, give it up, y'all, for the next reader. Sam Sachs is a poet and educator and the author of the great books, Madness and Bury It. He joins us right now from his home in the East Bay. Give it up for Sam Sachs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, can, am I good? Am I seen and heard? Excellent. Hey, uh, thank y'all for being here. And thank you guys so much for organizing this really remarkable event in and around your really remarkable store. Um, is appropriate I'm here for instead of Jack Hirschman because <laughs> uh, when I first moved to the Bay I was living for a minute on my friend's floor at a residential hotel like just up the block from City Lights I think it was like above the Mona Lisa or whatever and I went to Cafe Trieste and met Jack Hirschman before I knew who he was and then I was like oh you're a poet say a poem and then he said a, a poem to me and that was a really remarkable and I was like oh this must be what the Bay Area is right you're just like going to coffee shops and hearing, you know, legends say poems to you. Um, hi, I'm gonna read some poems, what a gift. So in the spirit of some kind of joy, uh, my brother just had twins. And so this is a poem uh, for my nibblings, which is the ungendered term for a niece and nephew. Um, and this is a poem in anticipation of their birth. Cool. My brother, knowing my work well, Asked I not include any references to semen in the throat in this poem I am writing you. So I shan't. Instead, semen in the books, semen in the leaves, semen in the ground that grows the semen trees, also known as the calorie pear, semen in the boat that carried our family here, semen in the waters where we left our dead, Semen in the meadows where we buried and bled, semen in the light streaming through the stained glass of our synagogue. The image depicting an ark in an ocean of semen. Gossamer semen, octopus semen, garden of semen. There are so many words for you children and none of them are dirty, though not all of them are yours. Now, as you eat what your mother eats, her fear is yours as your world is torn and thrown to birds, but still the light is thick in the trees. The calorie pears are loud this season and my throat is bright with flowers for you both. Such beautiful flowers. I hardly have the words. Cool. So the project of that poem was to say semen as much as possible and get to an ending where a reader can go, ah, oh, okay. Um, cracking. This next poem is for my buddy Steve who had, uh, I'm writing a book about pigs. Um, yeah, and so this is, uh, he had a part of a heart transplant. 
and they used a part of a pig's heart and it's called xenotransplantation. All right. Steve's got a pig heart in him or Steve's got part of a pig's heart a piece. His heart's part pig. The aortic valve is the dog god guarding the tube blood runs through once it's been scrubbed clean. One of two semi-lunar valves, which sounds like part of a moon, a piece. Steve's got moons in him, separating the two major atriums. Steve is full of ballrooms, those dark vaulted ceilings. Steve's a vegan. Steve's a vegan with a pig heart thumping club music. Steve believes the pig in him is vegan since it eats what he eats, speaks when he speaks. The pig heart pulses in his chest like a reflection of the moon in a puddle out behind the club once we're done dancing. Steve takes drugs so his body doesn't reject the organ. Steve takes drugs so he can go on dancing. His pig, grown to be sewn into a man's ribs, unnaturally selected. No god could have predicted this in that garden still. Holy the bit of tissue that lets him live and live. Thin miracle that set another 17 years going inside him. If you listen with one ear to the chest, you can hear the pig heart singing, calling out to any listening animal. All I want is to live and live and live and live and live. Um, cool. And for, and for my last poem, uh, my boyfriend right now is just fr frying up some onion rings, which is remarkable. Uh, what a gift, this life. Um, and so I realized recently, um, I like to get choked with a belt when uh, I have sex. Miracle, right? Um, you know, I'm 33 years old and still learning new things about the body. Who could imagine? Um, that's like my one sort of like optimistic sense and sensibility is that <laughs> you're always learning and inventing and finding new things about the self. Um, and so, yeah, this is about getting choked to the belt. And I'm going to do it with a little accompaniment. Ode to the belt. It's clear the future does not bode well for the living. My man won't let me forget where leather comes from. The engineered animal bent over in chemical grass. The hanged thing slit and blood slunk. Skin stripped and tanned in order to keep a man decent. I know how to keep a man. The belt knows how to keep order. The sound of his unbuckling Pavlovian. A sidewalk split into drooling meat. He beats me into my evening blush. I clutch pearls, eyes the color of a little red coat. Bless this bridle wrapped around my throat while he bloods me. Bless the constricted windpipes, unlikely music. Bless anything that can be remade to eke out pleasure from stone. Oh, bless all this life thrashing against death's garish precipice. Oh, bless me, Lord. Bless me, Dorman. Bless me, cormorant and courtship and torture and husbandry. Give me enough compression to remember I once lived here. And I'll accept, in the end, not even death will wife me. Um, thank y'all so much. I hope y'all are doing well at home. Appreciate y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Sam Sachs, y'all. Give it up. Keep keep pumping fists and power, jazz and hands and fingers and all that. See, that's the truth right there, Sam. Thank you for that, brother. Thank you. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sam. If your man makes you onion rings, your man makes you in your rings. You better hold on to that man. You hold on to that man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was beautiful, bro. That was that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful. So uh, we're gonna keep moving. And, and and I do see I do see the one and only Jack Hirschman using an alias. I see you there, Jack. Your user one. Hey, Jack. Do me a favor. Try looking in the bottom of your screen and hitting the the mute. Uh, go over to where the mute button is and click that. And it might unmute. We might be able to hear you. There we go. No, nope. can you you hit the mute button and off it? No, we still don't have it. Shoot, we got a uh, so sad. Well, this is this is part of the fun of a live event, guys. Right? We get to we get to uh, 
miscommunicate a little bit in, in live time. So uh, keep, keep, keep giving it a shot, Jack, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, someone actually just said that we can unmute him on your side. So Caitlin, maybe we can try unmuting him on, on, on our side. But uh, we're going we're gonna to move along and we'll come right back to you, Jack. We're going to figure out the technical difficulties. But Caitlin, if you could try uh, unmuting Jack on your side, maybe that'll work. So we love you, Jack. We love you. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, y'all uh, seeing hearing Sam and, and seeing Jack, it, it just I'm gonna I'm gonna ramble a little bit and I'm gonna say how much I really do miss being in that City Light store and talking to all of you about books and just being there, man, being in North Beach and seeing all these people, seeing Jack walk around, seeing him in the window. And I'll be honest, man, I, I even miss some of the, some of the customers that we might occasionally uh, go, what? Like the guy who always comes in and asks if we know who Bukowski is, <laughs> you know, or the uh, tour guide who, who walks by and says, that's uh that bookstore is where uh, Allen Ginsberg was born, you know, that kind of thing. But I even miss all that. I, I miss it. I miss y'all. I miss talking about books. Hopefully this is going to end sometime soon. But that uh, Jack's, Jack's still uh, working with it, so we're going to just move right on. We'll get to you, Jack. I promise. I promise. Yeah, y'all. So uh, up next, up next, uh, speaking of North Beach, speaking of, of the neighborhood, uh, we're actually very, very, very lucky right now. Um, next up uh, to talk to y'all, to, to open up your minds, is, uh, is a local. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, the one and only. Joanna Leokoshi is a Vesuvio bartender, North Beach resident. She's been a, Jan, Joanna, I think I just butchered your last name. I'm so sorry. It's, everyone does. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> hey, mispronunciation is part of the culture. It's so okay. uh, uh, Joanna has been a North Beach regular since childhood, man. And she's uh, recently <laughs> published her amazing book at Vesuvio, it's called, with uh, yep. another local institution, Last Gasp. She's very, very thankful for the help everyone's given to her neighborhood, coworkers, and friends in North Beach. So please, y'all, give it up and let's have a listen to Joanna. Yeah, Joanna. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we were just talking about how uh, missing North Beach and just missing the day to day. And I've been feeling very similarly um, to that. So I just wrote something about that. Okay. My dearest North Beach, after a strange turn of events, it seems as though you and I are taking a break for a while. I'll admit it, you are often quite intense, and I'm often fascinated about having weeks away from you, completely untethered from your vexing grasp. But now, like many great loves, your absence has left me with a feeling of longing and nostalgia for our better times. After we closed the doors of Vesuvio, I felt quite rejected by a love that I've known for 20 plus years. I know it wasn't your fault, it wasn't mine either. But locking those doors felt like dropping off a high school boyfriend at the Greyhound station as he left for college, and I remained in an unsettled place, seemingly alone. Would we meet again? Sure. Would it be different? Absolutely. In my unexpected and rather abrupt sadness, I escaped north to a small town here in California. Each mile felt like I was being pulled away from you, my home, my love. But in times of heartache, space is often the best medicine. I'd envisioned it like a grand romantic movie. You'd get word of my ruin, that I'd hopped a train somewhere, and you'd come find me. Unfortunately, as I arrived, I was welcomed by the news that your gesture would be impossible. I made a choice to stay and take some time. I didn't do it for me, but for us. As my Nana once told me at her Fall River kitchen table, you've got to let them miss you sometime. Therefore, I'm writing you this letter to let you know that while I reside, while I temporarily reside in a new, much quieter, safer, and smaller town, you have my word that I'll return. I know that we've both heard this before, but I've always remained true to you. Even after you recently sent a young homeless man my way to greet me each morning as I walked into work by telling me that he wanted to marry me and eat my pussy. Although it was a misstep on your part, the sentiment was there. I know you aren't always the best with your feelings. You're brazen and dramatic and drastic, and maybe that's why I keep coming back to you. 
anyway, my routine to change, but I'm hoping it's more temporary than permanent. They say it only takes 28 days to build or break a habit, so we'll have to see. Now I spend my mornings with pour over coffee in the yard watching the bees rather than iced coffee and endless greetings and gossip at Trieste. I love the bees, but I miss the busy bodies. My daily walk through Chinatown to you has been divided up into four or five walks throughout the day. Often alone, often with my friend and new roommate, Anna. We discuss home and family and feelings. We discuss fear and the government. Other times we philosophize about what we see. Today we saw a chocolate lab and I asked her if labs are nice dogs. She says they're like fuck boys, cute and nice to have around, but generally kind of dumb. On my walks, I finally befriended the neighboring animals, the pregnant goat I visit daily, the lukewarm cats, the chickens who either run from me or don't leave my side. They remind me of the locals we once shared. You have to have time and patience to earn their trust, but then they'll never leave you. I enjoy walking down the center of empty streets, gazing up on houses I'll never afford, and in the evenings watching kids that I don't think I want play kickball under the streetlights. That too reminds me of you. It's all just slower here. Other times my roommates and I turn mundane activities into funny games to pass the hours. We do eight minute butt exercises to Justin Bieber songs. We pretend we're contestants on the Great British Baking Show whenever we cook anything. I think it's helping. I think we'll be all right. I wonder about the old man in the veteran's cap who asked Anna if it's okay to freeze milk as we shop for groceries. He looked like Roy Motini around the mouth. That was day one if memory serves me. I'm learning Spanish and how to make yogurt and sourdough bread much like everyone else at home. The focaccia from LaGuardia is better. I'm believing in socialism more, thinking about temporarily moving to Sicily, hoping that that's the soft landing between mania and you. At night, after everyone's asleep, I sit outside and smoke cigarettes with the frogs and my neighbor's cat, Cosmo, rather than sitting outside of Specs with my friend, Jack. While it's not the same, it's as comforting. It isn't, but I'm telling myself that it is. I read articles about you and our friends. Yesterday, my boss told the Chronicle that bars are really about people and stories and connection, and that's the part I miss. I miss making people laugh, but I'm holding on to that. I don't wanna give up too much. I'm not sure what day it is. I fear that I've forgotten birthdays but can't bring myself to check. I dance in the living room and miss the saloon. I read my stacks of books for my neighbors at home and wish I could discuss them with Don and Caitlin and Ryan and Scott and Jack Kerouac Alley on our synchronized breaks. The local grocery clerks dress like California cowgirls and while helpful, they don't seem terrified by me like the man at the nature stop. The corner store lady is kind, but doesn't offer me bowls of cereal or popcorn like the man at the smoke shop next door. I go to hear the chimes at the church on the end of my block, but they're never on time. The neighbors say hi, but I don't know the names of their grandchildren. The sweet old lady Gloria who lives near me gives me oranges from her garden, but it makes me miss Millie. How she'd offer me urine soap cookies from the pocket of her peacoat, kiss me too close to my mouth and tell me to behave. It's all of these things about you that used to feel so ordinary and small. I know that everything will be different when I return. Your body will look strange and seemingly bare. I know some neighbors will not make it. I know you've done your best. This may affect your soul a bit, but we'll all help you build that back up in time. Look how we're already trying. I love you, North Beach. I fell in love with your heart that holds artists and families and writers, vagrants and freaks and history and community and power the heart I've always returned to, and the heart is the last part to quit. Keep your head up. I'll see you back at the house, baby. Love, Joe. Thank you. Give it up, y'all. Give it up. Uh, that was <laughs> Joanna. Thanks. Give it up, y'all. Give it up for Joanna Leoshi, please, for that. Joanna, we need that kind of remembrance right now, man. Our neighborhoods, you know? Yeah, I know. I miss it. I yeah. hate it and I miss it. <laughs> I really appreciate the details. I really do. Yeah. And, oh, and good. I, thank you. Yeah, I hope y'all we all, were feeling that as much as I was. Um, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, having me. People throwing kisses at you on the screen. So it, it was. It oh. was <laughs> so, 
sure. That's yeah. sweet. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank you for multiple listening. Multiple kisses at you. So, yeah, you know, um, that's uh, um, people. I know that's one thing that we we've, we've learned right now. Um, being inside is that, you know, when this is all over with, if we don't protect the spots in our neighborhood, even from a distance, they're not going to be there when we come back. So, um, you know, please take take a take a tip from the community that's that's backed up city lights and look to your own neighborhoods, look to your own communities and look for the spots, your beloved areas that need help and help them stand up for them, you know, please, please. And uh, keep on keeping on. All right. That's my two cents anyway. So <laughs> for those of you just tuning in, in case you are just tuning in, you are tuned in to City Lights Live. City Lights Book's first online live event going on. And now, now, uh, oh no, someone, you made someone cry, Joanna. She says she's crying. No, sorry. <laughs> it was probably my mom. So uh, one, one more time, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna reach out to uh, Jack Hirschman and see if he's available. Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Out there in Zoomlandia. It's a tough place to be, Zoomlandia, man. It's very, very peculiar. But can we, uh, is there any chance of getting Jack online? No? Well, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this moment to, uh, Introduce my uh, my co-host for the evening. This is Bulano Tescatliopoca. Maybe later on he'll recite a poem. I don't know. I don't know. But he's he's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. But in the meantime, uh, if we can't get Jack on the uh, on the horn here, we're going to go to our next uh, our next reader. Very excited um, to have Joshua Moore reading up next. Uh, Long time San Francisco resident. Joshua Moore is the author of the novel Damascus, which is set in the Mission District. Yeah. And contains our staff's favorite Hitler references since Don DeLillo's White Noise. Hey, we welcome him all the way from Seattle, y'all. Give it up for Joshua Moore. Hi, City Lights. How are you tonight? Hello, um, Joshua. Obviously, City Lights is very near and dear to my heart. I even have their logo tattooed on my arm right here so it's not a competition to see who likes city lights more I, i'm just saying i'm winning if there was a competition <laughs> actually i wanted to read a very short actor by the memoir coming out uh, next march uh, and i wrote the scene sitting in the poet's chair um, city lights upstairs so thank you city lights for being the muse uh, that midwifed this we are having dinner with friends in Berkeley. They are rich, and so we sit in a big backyard on a lavish couch. That's what rich people do, I guess, have couches outside. We watch our kids run through the sprinklers. The rascals have even found a way to angle one of the sprinklers to douse a big slide. So they can speed down it, crash into the bright green grass, look over at us laughing and gasping for air. Did you see that, Daddy? My daughter Ava asks. I bet you can go faster than that, I say. She accepts the challenge, and we continue like this, observing them, making small talk. But then their dad changes the topic of conversation to something grim. He's been drinking, and apparently this information has been speeding around his head like ghosts on their own wet slide. And so he burps this non sequitur. His friend has just committed suicide. Probably. It might have been an accidental overdose, but that's unlikely. I offer my condolences, but he keeps talking over me, over all of us, and he'll keep talking until this makes sense to him. He tells us that she had only one arm. She had only one arm because 20 years ago she shot up bug spray sucked the poison up into a syringe, shot it into her arm. It did spectacular damage to her body and the only way they could save her was to amputate the toxic limb. He is drinking more red wine. and He's not really looking at any of us as he spills the story. He has the information in his head, but it's formless, like dry sand and you can't make anything out of dry sand. And so he has this sliding pile of news about her overdose and his mind can't make sense of any of it. My instinct is that nobody can make sense of this unless you've tried to take your own life. If you are in our disgusting club, 
you take that dry sand and add an angry liquid and suddenly you can form anything you want out of those sandy facts. I want to say to him, I know what it's like to swallow so many pills to escape this place. Know what it's like to look around and see only despair. When your surroundings are polluted like that, you know beyond any doubt that your life will never get better. You know with absolute clarity that leaving has to be better than being here. And so you find whatever supplies will midwife you away. You find a needle and poison to eradicate insects and you shoot the solution into your system and you wonder, well, if it kills the creepy crawlies that infest the outside world, will it work its magic in me? Can it clean me? Can this poison purify? Her arm, I can imagine it. I can see it wilting, that gangrenous, oozing limb, a herald of the whole body if they hadn't hacked it away. I remember in the aftermath of my own suicide attempt feeling thrilled at my cowardice, how my whole being puked up those pills because once they landed in my stomach, waiting to kick in and kill me, that's when I realized how badly I wanted to survive. My face over the toilet, my mouth open, my pills leaving me, landing with a splash, the smell of bile and tequila, the tears in my eyes making everything look shattered. The infamy of not following through with it, the futility of going on, least like that. And this woman's missing arm was invisible to everyone except her. I bet she saw it. I know she saw it. She saw it every day. She saw it and she felt it and she loved it. We mutilate ourselves, not out of hate, but from a place of sanctuary. Because it feels good. Because it's a relief, an antidote, either temporary or permanent. She needed to follow her arm's example and go. She needed to see this other world for herself. Hell, maybe the arm had been reporting back to her. Hell, maybe the arm knew something incredible. A healing e ecosystem awaits. Yes, a lush garden of angels whose amputated arms flap around like beautiful birds and everyone is cured and everybody is happy. But these aren't the sort of things we're supposed to say in casual conversation, especially on a fancy outdoor couch, especially while our kids zoom down their makeshift water slide and land on the bright green grass, laughing and laughing and laughing, angels in this strange, noxious place. Thank you very much. Yeah, keep it going for Joshua Moore. Yeah, this is Joshua. Joshua, how are you gonna how are you gonna tell us you got a City Lights tattoo and not show it to us, man? Where, oh, it's right there, man. where is it? I thought it was like in a in a sexy spot. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> I can't show you my barber pole. That would be too inappropriate. I can just show you this one here. <laughs> they don't censor anything on Zoom. It's cool. You can do what you know, do what you like. Do what you like. That was beautiful, Joshua. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Man, that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful, y'all. All right, y'all. We're gonna we're gonna keep going. And uh, um, hey, you know, I, I did want to bring up a, a very quick point for uh, our uh, our family out there that that are. Uh, we, you know, we talked about it briefly, how we're, we're all missing the store tremendously. And, uh, you know, a big part of the City Lights is the City Lights events that happen in the store. You know, the poets come and read. We have author events constantly. I mean, Peter Marvellis has a huge schedule of, of, of people coming through, uh, you know, all the way, all the, the entire year. And um, that's been real difficult for us not representing like that. So I'm actually really excited to say that um, on May 1st, uh, City Lights' is virtual calendar of events is going to come up. So um, y'all are missing some of the events, some of the writers. Uh, please look, look, look online May 1st and check out the calendar because we're going to have a lot of live streaming author talks and readings and stuff like that. So 
it'll help tide us over, you know, until we're able to actually get into the beautiful store that we all miss so much. So uh, yeah, keep, keep your eyes out for that. May 1st, uh, City Lights' virtual calendar is going up. So, so next up, next up on our, on our readers list, man. Oh man, up next. Woo, I'm excited. I spent a summer in a van with this man driving all over the US, getting really stinky. And I gotta say, there's no one else like James Tracy, man. James Tracy is an author, organizer, and educator, man. The three big ones. His latest book, uh, City Lights is for No Fascist USA, is co-authored with Hillary Moore and is published by City Lights. Yeah, he joins us from his home in Oakland. Give it up for James Tracy, y'all. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, that's right. Josiah and I have traveled all over these preoccupied territories with each other. It's part of the Molotov Mouse Outspoken Word Troop many moons ago. Uh, like, like Josiah, I've uh, considered people like Elaine and Stacy and Peter part of my extended family for many years. Uh, yeah, uh, this year published No Fascist USA, the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements on City Lights and Open Media Publishing. We know that this fantastic counter institution is much more than a publishing house or a bookstore. It is an international, maybe intergalactic hub that has welcomed the poets, the revolutionaries, the near-do-wells, the revolutionaries of every variety, the black sheep, the black panthers, queers, feminists, writers of mad manifestos and many others. I even know a stockbroker who quit his job because of what he read when he took lunch in the poetry room. Maybe we can get a few police officers to visit that, that poetry room as well. City Lights has always been a sanctuary for me. I used to cut school to hang out in the poetry room. My creative writing teacher, Jim Fredenberg, had given me a teacher, given me a copy of Diane DePrimo's Revolutionary Letters. Sometimes I think that my cutting school was part of an elaborate plot that began with that gift. I found the writers who are still with me today, some of which are Bob Kaufman, Maya Angelou, John Fonte, Charles Bukowski, and Wanda Coleman. For City Lights, I wrote a book about fighting fascism. Before that, I wrote a book about fighting displacement. Before that, I wrote a book about the first rainbow coalitions, an antidote to fascism and displacement. One thing that fascism and displacement have in common is that they signify the death of the human imagination. One proposes that we should embrace the monster that has always been at the door and trade songs of liberation for the sound of jackboots hitting the pavement. The other proposes that the city, one of humankind's most dramatic inventions, exists only as a carnival of inequality and private consumption. But locations like City Lights are the antidote to the pandemics we face of fascism, vanishing empathy, and soul-killing homogeneity. For the, from the first days of the conquest to the battles for unions to the fight for AIDS, there are stories at City Lights that will instruct us on how to survive this plague and the plague after that and the plague after that. The books that City Lights publishes and promotes are seeds, much in the way that Greek poet uh, Dinos Christian Apollos said, put it when he said, what you didn't do to bury me, but you forgot that I was a seed we are all seeds. City Lights is a seed. Thanks to Lawrence, Nancy, Peter, Josiah, Chris, Andy, Stacy, Caitlin, Greg, Linda, and all the others who have tended to the spiritual seed against fascism. Save what you love. Save what someone else loves. Fight for yourself. Fight for someone you don't know. Fight for someone you don't know. Find love in the days of rage. Build love in the days of plague. All power to the imagination. Long live City Lights. And that's about that. Yeah. Yeah, James. That's a manifesto right there, man. That's beautiful. That was a beautiful manifesto. Y'all heard that, right? Y'all heard that? Y'all heard James? Man. That's yes, James. That, 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 that was a, we needed that, man. We needed that. 
We needed that. Damn, damn, righteous. Yeah, we got righteous. We love city lights. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Gracias, yes, James. Really, from the heart. Thanks, brother. Oh, man, Woo. I'll take a breath for a minute for that one. <laughs> the man just touched on so many important things, man. It's such a legacy that this bookstore has, and such a future that it still has. So, man, man. So moving on, uh, moving on. Wow. Um, so our next, uh, well, you know, I mean, James brought up the legacy of City Lights uh, and the roots and everything. But, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, uh, the Pocket Poet series from City Lights is probably one of City Lights' most enduring and uh, recognized contributions to our literary landscape. You all know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you're talking about like, like the Pocket Poet series, right? Right? This series, this series right here, man, in so many ways, um, epitomized uh, the ideals of City Lights. Uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the founder, first started producing these books in affordable paperback editions, man, which was a uh, pretty revolutionary back then because by doing the paperback editions, Lawrence made literature accessible to people that normally wouldn't have access to these, 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 this knowledge, this poetry. So uh, in a lot of ways, man, the Pocket Poet series is like, City Lights is a, like, I don't know, it's just like the most iconic thing for me. When I think of the Pocket Poets, you know, I think City Lights. Um, you know, and these things, they were designed to fit in your pocket. How high tech is that, man? <laughs> I mean, uh, who doesn't remember their first City Lights Pocket Poet book, right? Man, well, um, the series publishes true revolutionary writers of the written word, man. True revolutionary writers of the written word. And uh, here in the Bay Area, we're blessed, we're truly blessed uh, to have living amongst us uh, and performing for you all tonight, the 61st poet in the City Lights Pocket Poet series. And y'all, there is a definite connection to this and this. You all know this man. His book is called Heaven is All Goodbyes. He is Tongo Eisen Martin. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you can tell by my tires that not everybody who's driven with me is still alive. Also, that I like my drinks neat bottled and in a bus stop. Also, that we're drowning in precinct paper department store floor plans and applications to the moon. And we can change the color of our snot from gifted to heart attack and tell you about ashes, where all these angels coming from smelling like the cigarette that fills. And why is the man on the safe side, his headlights freezing up? You know, you got nothing to say at my funeral, I'll speak on your behalf, heroin in my smile. Mountain made a flatland robbery among some things on my mind. The last door run in the name of shared after life Friday to the filter, I'm a tall tale on earth. But here's to that angel that never appeared to America and not a dog pal in a batch of hangovers looking for a home. You know, a liar wouldn't have lived this long. That's my human when fences speak. On a pair of rambling dice that got unique tempers and young souls that say shut up about our city. Here title must crash over a coast while lie. The streets teeth are in pieces. There's reservoir art on the faces of stragglers. It's sad news from back home to me. We have to grow up on his behalf. Stumble back to a car full of last stand. The truth is still, but still liquor. Mission Street will be proud of me. I'm a mural man, almost organized. Remember when my lungs would wake up last walking on morning. If it was worth it, I'm three decades homeless. And reservoir art is all I ever see. And I'm 2,000 miles from my first fight. Maybe no one really survived. Maybe I wrote my first poem for no reason. I go to the railroad tracks and follow them to the station of my enemies. A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative. All over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big cosmic basket and why blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho-spiritual refusal to write white history or take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm, ricochet sewage near where I collapse into a rat-infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti. In the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up. House of God in part, no cops in part. My body brings down to Christmas. The new bullets pray over blankets made from old bullets. Pray over the 28th hour's next beauty mark. 
extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration, the waistband before the next protest post. Hey, by the way, time is not an illusion, Your Honor. I will save your desk for last. You are witty, Your Honor. You're moving money again, Your Honor. It's only raining one thing, non-white cops. And prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk floating on an oil spill. The neighborhood making a lot of fuss over its demise. A new late for a Black Panther party. Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder. The figment of village. A new noose to a new white preacher. All in an abstract painting of a president. Bought, bought slavery some time, didn't it? The tantric screeches of military boats and election Tuesday cars. A cold-blooded study in leg irons. And the leg irons inside of a tornado shelter. Leg irons inside of your body. Proof that some white people have actually fondled nooses. That sundown couples made their vows of love over opaque peach plastic and bolt, bolt action audiences. You know, the Medgar Ever Second is definitely my favorite law of science. Found of news clippings and primitive Methodists, my arm changes and imperialism. Simple policing versus structural frenzies. Elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums. Artless bleeding and the challenge of watching civilians think. At terrible rituals they have around the corner, they let their elders beg for public mercy. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads and the arrows myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest. Modern fans of war, what with their t-shirt poems and t-shirt guilt and me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on a bus, I have no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. I talk facing away from the dead. They replace me with the change in my pocket, a penny that's yet to be invented. They say, you have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, I became content with the small gestures of plantation fires. Playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. You know, it exists in so many places, so many random things. It interrupts me while I'm trying to dream. Like your clay correspondence, Lord. To be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind. Explored what's naturally there. And I found no brainwashing. I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diasporic South. I have morning possessions, modern militancy. I mean, window to the South. I'll walk on a missile for food. I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country I murdered? Merge with us, Lord. Our old metal versus new metal. Our old metal versus a pool of meandering imperialist faces, a multiculturalism of sorts. The dead replaced me with a comedian's chest cavity instead of a chest cavity held tight. You know, it takes a violent middle man for me to talk to myself. Stories that travel through other people's stories. A song about a song, a hemisphere about a hemisphere. Stories that travel through a conquered poet. And my mother remembers Africa, Lord. She killed on behalf of you, Lord. I wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant. I read 1,000 books in front of the world. You know, what I do is fight poems and sleep through decadent San Francisco prayer circles. Watch people play for post-working class associative services or recreations of a governor's desk. You know, ruling class art of utility, playing find the sociopathic bureaucrat. A day some white people scare even easier. TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby wearing ceramic armor. Musket progeny fantasizing through the art of the poor. Their trendy latches locked before God. Black art hunted down like a dog. A hand over my friends, Lord. Lord, I think I'm going to die in a war. Unelected white people in my small house like a blue song of no spiritual effect. A dollhouse ace bomb. A pony show near dead bodies. Apartheid weddings that go right. Apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians. The spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations. A chemical interpretation of a Sunday trip to church. Church smells in their pockets. A river mistaken for a talking river. No autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use. Made in the image of God's trinkets. What well, white abolitionists confided in their children about. Chemical assurances that they will switch from black artists to white artists. Black guy to white guy, black worker to white worker. I think about you cautiously, Lord. In the same way I think about my childhood. Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is mute. A comedian points out a planter's field to a priest. King Sugar Cane, King Cotton, King Revolutionary, the bottle essential, containing all modes of shallow introduction, introducing an unlisted planter class speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masses that we can figure out our fathers later. A priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of parishioners, re raveling fantasies about black art. Priest reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. After today, I've never been a poet before. A little brother watches his big brother's friends. They lean rifles on shelter walls. They agree with me and call it literature. It's a simple matter, this revolution thing. To really lie to no one. To keep nothing God-like. To write a poem for God. Give it up, give it up for Tongo, Eisen Martin. Is it right here, y'all? Run outside, forget the infestations, go to the liquor store and buy this book. <laughs> this is it, man. D.
that, 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 that piece isn't even in here, is it? That's some new fire. Man. Ooh. Gracias. Gracias, y'all. That was beautiful, Tongo. Thank you. Man. Man. Woo. All right. We need to take a, a small breath. Let's all take a collective small breath. That's it. And uh, Tongo Tori in Stockton says, please publish that. <laughs> So y'all, uh, man, uh, gracias so much, T. Um, so uh, uh, up next, up next, uh, we're we're, all, we're almost at the end, but we, we, we as as it, we get closer to the end, it gets heavier and heavier, man, with the veteranos and the OGs. And up next uh, for me is is uh, is the maestro right here, man. So y'all prepare yourself. Uh, next up is the former poet laureate of these United States, and the author of the forthcoming City Lights book, Every Day We Get More Illegal. And he also put these beauties out from City Lights, ma'am. There is no other poeta like this poeta. Give it up, y'all, for the maestro, Juan Felipe Herrera. Oh, man. Oh, that was beautiful. This is really beautiful. Uh, I'm really, um, I feel like I'm back. You know, I feel like I'm back in, um, in the city, I'm back on, on Columbus. I'm back with City Lights uh, downstairs, 1966, 1967, 68, 69. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'm really uh, kind of uh, getting in touch because of all the ports tonight and all the words and the energy. And, and it feel, I feel really close. I feel intimacy, and I feel it in many ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Elaine and Josiah and Stacy, the whole team, and all the poetas. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm humbled by your by your by your um, by your beauty and your heart and everything uh, you are, uh, how it comes out, and it's all one. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm just going to read from uh, 1974 to the present, as opposed to reading in pieces. So I'm going to do a little bit of that. Uh, this is uh, kind of like a 1970 book, uh, printed Occupied Water Tank in San Diego, Balboa Park. And uh, then I'm going to just keep on rolling. Arco iris, mil colores. Come whirling, shining, come pouring, a celebrar, to celebrate la tierra, the earth nueva, new to churn to make, una canción, a song, to grow, to young soil, in our woven hands, violetas, violet, yellow, green, lluvia, rain, arco iris, rainbow, luminosa trenza, flores, flowers in the sky. Cabeza redonda, sembrando la nación, sowing the nation, vida, fresca, yes, in our heart, es la luz. There is the light we bring del sol from the sun, ancient on our head. One thousand pétalos rising, flower de maíz, dulce, trenza, luminosa. Come weaving, darkness, cuerpos, sin lucha, luz, tu vida a sprouting heart, a sostener, to sustain, a refrescar, to refresh cada día, every day, a nutrir, to nourish, amor, luminoso, luminous love, flaming, arco, iris, rainbow. There is so much to say. There are no words, no script, no vowels. We head toward a new society. Is it a democracy? Is it oneness? Is it being unto infinity? Is it now? It is now. After reading Sin Total Corn Goddess, I noticed we, during Calpuli, collective city, the reading of Poetas del Pueblo, poets of the people, Copal, incense, at La Plaza de las Tres Culturas. Our voices had multiplied. 
Coyol Shalki, dismembered one, Ocelotl Comal Sarten Takuche, Jaguar, Frying Pan, Takuche, our new suit, our rock face, our voices, had been condor wing brushed colored, Popocatepetl, Mountain Warrior, Penacho, Bead, Skybolt, even though, aunque, as Jose Montoya used to say, aunque, that is, Jade Sacrifice, Canto, our voice, movement, era, jazz, Oyin had attained. Alcalde, Nezahualcoyotl, Hungry Coyote, Malinche, Malinali, Honduras, El Grande, El Paso. We are breathing fire trains. We were sowing maíz azul, bathing in its blaze, bluish life. Love flourishes for the first time. Grocery bags have a tendency to wobble. At six feet, social distance, you can crash into the toy section. At six feet, flaring stars create another star. At six feet, blushing will take you down. A chili bowl will wreak havoc by itself. At six feet, freedom blossoms in all its colors. The power between us is magnificent. Peace opens, rises, and accelerates. Your tenderness opens its door. Love flourishes for the first time. Into the distance. You know, this is, I feel like we're all, almost, I think we're all doing the same thing. Uh, we're all in this so together, not just together, but, but inside ourselves together, as opposed to outside ourselves together. I feel like that, like we're inside ourselves together and we're going somewhere and we're there now. And it's so new, there are no words for it, even though that's what we use, that's what we have. And we have music, but it's so new, we're trying almost every instrument there is, all the strings we can find, the cat on our lap. So, so I'm just um, putting stuff out, not knowing really where I'm headed which is usually where I'm going, but now I'm not, but now it's even more unknown than it used to be, which is odd. And, Hello. And Siri wants to talk to me. Into the distance. We go, the separated ones, the folding blue yellow skies into what? They clear that restless COVID-19 for a moment. This killer truth has no name, nombre, no name. Let us call it unleashed ancient creeper serpent, serpiente. It is simply our shattered iris. Our shirts, threaded hearts into each other. We're the last lost children. Tiny hats made of smoke. We go now. Beginning a story, a line, a syllable never whispered. We stand, we stand and move and step into the distance. It is not the scaling skyscraper, a skew, big daddy data, robot mind talkware. Hachwinik, we are true person now. Hachwinik, we are true person on trek through the fallen lumber. It is oneness, it is oneness, it is oneness, our goal. A new era, our jelly heart beats. No gun, no pig slaughter, no sound it seems. We glimpse the sun, the sun is our name. The moon is our name. We go into the distance, cobalt blue, 
faces of gold stare on to infinity. We go, we weep, we sing, we ascend into the distance. The city gone, the Ferris wheel, new rolls down Broadway in Columbus. Those who passed, we stop and consider. First responders with splinter mask, ventilators without words, to the sight of the beds, humble and diligent. Yesterday, yesterday, ayer, it is a new intersection, nothing ahead. We enter the distance, amble, lean, and careening we go through the flame, powers against themselves. Wars, COVID sweeps as greed sweeps. We sing for those gone. We enter into the distance. We greet the celebration, unknown and loved. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, give it up for Juan Felipe Herrera. Thank you, thank you. Que chido, maestro. En serio, que chido, man. Gracias, thank you. And thank you for uh, for bringing up Jose Montoya as well. <laughs> come on, come on. Yes, 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 yes. Man. Yes, Jose Montoya. There's so much, so much to write and so much to to listen to. And I, I, I really appreciated your remembrance of going into City Lights, too. Gracias, maestro. Seriously. <laughs> High school days. Man, yeah, yeah. All of us. That, the, the place yeah. has been with us forever. <laughs> <laughs> Molinari's high school days. It works. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, y'all. Well, that was Juan Felipe Herrera. And when is, when is the City Lights book coming out? Do we know, uh, maestro? We said October, I think. October. Yeah. Okay. That's, we're I'm very excited for that. Very excited. I also heard that... Flower Songs is going to uh, publish some of your earlier work as well. Is that correct? That is that is correct. I see the word got out. Oh, yeah. yeah. We pochos. We're, we're chismosos, man. You got the pocho lines. Yeah, you can't tell one of us nothing, man. We all hear about it. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, those, those were sweet days. Those were sweet days. So you see, uh, you see the style. Yeah, you see the style. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I just said, I told uh, Flower and Song, I said, uh, with, uh, you know, I've been carrying this book since 1974, and just a handful of copies, and if you're interested, here it is. And, and they said, yeah, sure. Oh, man, I said, okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, exciting. It it's really exciting. And yeah, like we said, uh, Juan Felipe's City Lights book is going to come out in October, so. Man, gracias, maestro, gracias. Thank you, thank you. Oh, y'all, what a beautiful evening we've been having, people. Y'all still with me or what? Y'all still with me? Let me see some some movement out there, huh, in, in Zoomlandia. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. We've been celebrating City Lights tonight um, in such a wonderful fashion uh, with these artists and poets and neighborhood family. Uh, so it's been a real beautiful event. Um, you know, I just, on my part, uh, I would like to uh, leave you all uh, with this humble rumination on coming from me for the bookstore. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's a community space, a neighborhood gathering place. It's a sanctuary of words, three floors of ideas. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It is Bay Area history. It is a place where freedom of speech was fought for. It's where revolutionaries sing. It's where the masses are always welcome to come in and sharpen their minds. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's an underground tunnel. It's a trap door. It's a subterranean piece of art. It's a trick of the eye. It is memories of what this city was really like. It's a hideout from what this city now is. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It is proof that printer's ink is the greatest explosive. 
It is a place where people go to find the next uprising, where the writers go to find their next inspiration, where the poets go to find the next word. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's an arrival of ideas, a departure of tradition, a continuation of rebellion. It's a magic spot that glows a perfect blue between the hours of three and five in the morning. It's a sacred grove of trees, a circle of holy rocks. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's sleight of hand. It's a wrinkle in time. It's a throwback. It's a niche. It's exactly what the person who comes from somewhere else expects to see when he looks for San Francisco. It's exactly what the third generation San Franciscan expects to see when they look out their window, man. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's a creek in the poet's rocking chair upstairs. It shouts and screams coming from Kerouac Alley. It's an open until midnight blessing. It's a bag of old bones. It's ashes that have been scattered all over San Francisco, man. It is Campo Santo. It is fertile ground. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's a poet's American dream. A rabble rouser's prophecy, man. It's a beatnik church. It's a Bay Area religion. Behind the bookshelves, there are hieroglyphics, pictographs, dead phone numbers, and ballpoint prophecies about what comes next. City Lights is not just a bookstore. It's a holy day. It's a vision, it's a language, it's a declaration, it's resistance. It is home, it is home, it is home. It is home y'all, gracias y'all. Gracias to all our amazing performers, Beth Lissick, Karen Finley, Kim Shuck, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, Jack Hirschman, Jenna K. Stuckey, Sam Sachs, Joanna Leoshi, Joshua Moore, the one and only James Tracy, the one and only Tongo Eisen Martin, and the maestro himself, Juan Felipe Pereira. You've all been wonderful, y'all. You've all been beautiful. It's so wonderful to see all your faces. We're going to see you in real time real soon, I promise. Que viva City Lights, y'all. Que viva City Lights.